Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are here for the Meet the Scientist webinar series, and uh, I'm Jacqueline Quiroz, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you today for uh, the meeting the University, the Kansas University Alzheimer Disease Center. Uh, just to remind everybody, so the Meet the Scientist is an opportunity to meet a teams or investigators that are working to end Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. This is an opportunity for everybody to, to meet the teams that are actually uh, working in very exciting research uh, in the field of Alzheimer's disease, especially an opportunity for junior investigators to ask questions in a more informal setting and also to learn about a potential career opportunities that may be available for them. So this is the, the last one that we have for the spring of 2021. We are taking a break for the summer and then we are uh, coming back in September. So to learn more about the, the schedule and, um, and the opportunities that we have for me, the scientists, so please uh, visit our website and you can see uh, the teams that are meeting in the future. So now uh, I'm gonna pass it to uh, our uh, guests today and thank you again for joining us. Dr. Perales. All right, thank you, let's see. Um, so thank you, Dr. Quiroz, for inviting us, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Jaime Perales, and I'm honored to introduce the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. It is led by Dr. Swerdlow and Dr. Burns. And I'm going to try to go forward. All right. Um, we're located in the middle of the country, where you see this little star in the middle. Um, this is in Fairway, it's near Kansas City, Kansas, and bordering Kansas City, Missouri. So we serve people usually from both sides of the state line. Um, we're one out of 32 nationally designated, uh, NIA designated Alzheimer's disease centers. Uh, nationally, we got our first designation in 2011, the following one in 2016, and, uh, and we're working on the next one that's this year. Um, we have three different uh, main goals as a P30. One is to advance Alzheimer's disease and brain aging research. Our main lines are in uh, mitochondrial contributions to Alzheimer's disease and dementia risk reduction through lifestyle modification. Um, another goal is to serve as a Midwestern hub for Alzheimer's disease research, care, and education. And then the third one is to enhance the Alzheimer's disease research center network. Here's the outline of talks that we're gonna to give today. We have, um, I think 16 different uh, researchers and staff members from the ADC, ADRC. Um, the first two talks are for about research with minoritized populations. The next ones are about Alzheimer's disease uh, risk reduction then mitochondrial contributions to Alzheimer's disease, and then we'll have some, uh, uh, some room for job opportunities and Q&A. So let's start with the research with minoritized populations. We have two uh, main lines of research, one with African-American and black individuals led by Dr. Shaw, who will be presenting right after me, and one with a Latino community that I lead. I'm an assistant professor at the KU Medical Center I'm the Latino Research Director and the Assistant Director for Inclusive Science in the Average and Recruitment Corps. My expertise is in dementia disparities. Back in Spain and in the United Kingdom, I work in disparities related to gender and socioeconomic status. And upon moving to the United States, I started focusing more on the Latino population, even though I also work with the African-American and LGBT communities. Uh, my main interest is in building interventions to reduce dementia disparities, specifically in the Latino community. Um, there are about 60 million uh, Latinos in the United States. It's about 18% of the population. Uh, they're highly diverse uh, with regards to their country of origin, citizenship status, race, etc. And when we think of Latinos, we usually think of California, Texas, or Florida. However, uh, Latinos, there's, there's a high concentration of Latinos in many of the counties in, in the state of Kansas. If you can see Wyandotte County, which is where the KU Medical Center campus is, one third of the population identifies as Latino. And in Southwest Kansas, uh, the percentage is even higher, reaching 60% of the population of Seward County, for example. Uh, Latinos are mainly of Mexican origin and uh, the, their presence is mostly related, related to 
uh, the Santa Fe Rail that goes across the state of Kansas and several meat packing plants across the state. Latinos experience several disparities in dementia um, compared to non-Latino whites. They have lower levels of knowledge about dementia. They're one and a half times more likely to get dementia, even though some of our research and others has shown that this might vary by Latino group. They also have lower uh, detection of dementia and other types of cognitive impairments, uh, less access to dementia medication, to caregiver support groups, and higher uh, unmet needs related to behavioral symptoms of dementia. Latinos are unfortunately underrepresented in research, uh, especially uh, in privately funded research and especially in clinical trials. And our goal, our main goal from, our, from my line of research is to understand these disparities better and to address these disparities by developing interventions. Um, in our past grants, the, we had an NIA degree supplement, a Frontiers Trade Besser grant. We developed a network of the Latino community together with us against Alzheimer's and several community organizations such as um, Guadalupe Centers, Don Bosco, and these are uh, community and senior centers uh, and the media, the local media as well. Um, we also developed a culturally linguistically tailored um, educational intervention for Latinos. And we showed that we were able to increase Latinos' levels of Alzheimer's knowledge, their willingness to participate in research, and we increased their participation in the NAC cohort from two Latino participants to 42 in a couple of years, most of them Spanish speakers. Um, we continue with this cohort through our P30, the center grant. Uh, we have a retention rate of about 70%. Um, and we recently got a KO1, this is a career development uh, award and an intervention developing award, the R21. Um, the first one we have, the, we have conducted about 45 uh, interviews with primary care providers and Latino families with dementia across the country to understand what services uh, people with Latinos with dementia and their families are receiving in primary care. This is gonna follow up with, uh, with an AIM-2 and it's an intervention that we're gonna um, instruct uh, or train primary care providers to detect dementia as early as possible among Latinos uh, and then provide evidence-based care and refer them to um, culturally linguistically proficient dementia navigators that would help them uh, along their disease. Um, by the way, we're looking for uh, dementia navigators. So if anyone is aware of uh, social workers that are bicultural, bilingual, and have experience uh, addressing uh, people, of, uh, Latino, basically Latinos, uh, please let us know. Um, we also have an R21, and this is a two-year grant in which we're developing, and we will soon test in July the first text message intervention for Latino caregivers so they can take care of themselves and their loved one with dementia. And we will do this recruitment nationally, so if you know any Latino families with dementia, please feel free to refer them to us. Um, and then at the bottom right, we have our uh, my team, basically. Uh, thank you, and with this, I'm going to pass the torch to... Um, Ashley Shaw, Dr. Ashley Shaw. Thank you. Um, as Hi May mentioned, my name is Dr. Ashley Shaw. I am a research assistant professor at the uh, University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Center. And a lot of my work focuses on dementia uh, reduction in the African-American community using community-engaged approaches. Um, so essentially my research interests encompass racial and ethnic health disparities and dementia, recruitment and retention um, among older African-Americans, as well as dementia prevention through developing culturally tailored lifestyle interventions with particular focus on diet. Can you um, forward the slide? Um, so my program of research really is shaped by my strong interest in understanding the intersection between culture, lifestyle behaviors, and brain health with particular focus on disparities in aging. Uh, so the primary goal of my work is really threefold essentially developing and implementing culturally tailored community-based programs to enhance awareness, knowledge, and influence behavioral changes, uh, address lifestyle risk factors, particularly psychosocial factors associated with diet, diet that are related to dementia. And then lastly, understanding pathways forward to dementia prevention through interventions in relation to culture. And so, as I had mentioned, the work that I do really is employed by a community-based approach so that involves um, 
community leaders. So I work closely with the Black Healthcare Coalition community members and also the research team to really guide the development and dissemination of programs and, and interventions that I uh, work with. Can you move to the next slide? Okay, thanks. Uh, and then um, I just wanna share one study that we just recently completed, which was an Aging with Grace program. It's a culturally tailored dementia prevention educational curriculum um, that I've led since 2019. Uh, really, the goal of this study was to collaborate with predominantly African-American serving organizations and community leaders to engage, enhance knowledge of dementia prevention, um, as well as enhance participation in our uh, clinical trials using the program. And so the purpose of this study was to explore how the curriculum um, impacted enrollment within our trials, as well as perceived knowledge and perception in clinical trials. Um, so from March 2019 to August 2019, we had a total of 66 community members who attended the Aging with Grace presentation. And we did see a change within clinical trials interest and enrollment. Uh, as far as enrollment in our, in our clinical cohort, which is our observational study, we saw an increase of 83%. Um, and within our lifestyle prevention trials, we saw an increase in enrollment by 52%. As far as perception within the curriculum itself, um, we examined how valuable and applicable the community perceived the curriculum to be, in which they rated it as very good to excellent with a mean Likert score of 4.45 and 3.76. Uh, and then as far as community needs, through the surveys that we collected, the community did indicate that they perceived education, opportunities for service and care, and lifestyle prevention activities as their greatest needs. So findings from this particular study has really informed the current work that I do now, in which uh, for my KO1 intervention, I am working to develop a culturally adapted brain healthy diet int intervention to reduce the risk of uh, dementia within the black community. So now uh, we're gonna present the Alzheimer's disease risk reduction. We have Dr. Burns. All right, hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Jeff Burns. I co-direct the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center with Russ, who you'll hear from. Uh, and uh, my focus is primarily on dementia uh, prevention or Alzheimer's risk reduction, but I also uh, do a lot with uh, treatment trials uh, in Alzheimer's. But go ahead, next slide, Jaime. Um, so I'm going to talk sort of big picture about our dementia risk reduction program, and then you'll hear bits and pieces of, uh, of the studies. But I want to start with this slide. This is a, a slide that shows the sustained reduction in cardiovascular deaths from 1970 to 2010. And I like it because I think it sort of paints a picture of where I think we're headed in, in terms of dementia prevention. Um, and we're just getting started. We're probably where we were in the 70s for cardiovascular disease, um, where we're starting to see a bend in the curve. Um, so, I, I, you know, we're just getting started. And I think the other point this slide makes is it's going to take a lot of different things to bend the curve. Um, it's going to take drugs, it's going to take technology, and it's going to take lifestyle interventions. And I think that's what's happening in coronary artery disease. And uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, our work, so with that in mind, you know, we're focused a lot on lifestyle factors. We're also focused on metabolism, and you'll hear a lot about that. Um, our exercise trials, just to give you a few little specifics, um, we have found evidence that exercise uh, does have some modest uh, uh, brain benefits, but even at low doses, and that it's important to drive cardiovascular fitness, heart and lung function. Um, if we do enough exercise to boost heart and lung function, we, we think that's necessary to see gains in brain function. Um, the other thing we found is uh, evidence that we may be slowing this, the Alzheimer's related uh, changes in the brain, memory decline and brain atrophy. But most recently we did a study, pretty big study, where we looked at amyloid in uh, about 112 people, I think, um, cognitively normal folks and did not see any, any effect on amyloid, suggesting that if, if exercise is good for the brain, it's probably not through amyloid related mechanisms. Um, and this has led to our, you know, sort of overall hypothesis, and you'll hear again about this, but that, you know, that positive effects on the brain, at least with, from exercise, it's likely related to metabolic and neurovascular effects. Um, and so we have a number of intervention studies that are 
aimed at understanding this better. Um, next slide. This is a summary of some of our ongoing studies from different investigators. Uh, so we have a, you know, uh, some drug development studies, primarily Russ Swerdlow's studies on uh, drugs like oxaloacetate or Esequal. Um, and then lifestyle, we think of lifestyle as a metabolic intervention um, and a vascular intervention uh, and sort of pleiotropic intervention, but we can frame it as a metabolic intervention as well. And so we're studying uh, lifestyle exercise, diet, uh, and the impact on the brain uh, in a variety of ways. Some big studies, the IGNITE study, which is enrolling over 600 people into a one-year trial, the RRAD study, which is vascular risk reduction, and then uh, Russ's ketogenic study, and we got uh, Deb Sullivan doing a Mediterranean diet study. And then most recently, we're, we've launched a health system-wide blood pressure control study looking at um, you know vascular effects there. So a pretty big and growing uh, portfolio of studies focused on metabolism and lifestyle. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and this is the good news. This is the uh, evidence that I think we're already having an impact. There's three or four studies now that show that dementia risk at a certain age is lower today than it was say 30 years ago. Um, um, and I think that gives us, uh, gives us more fuel for the fire of going after the these dementia risk reduction strategies. And last slide, Jaime. Mean, um, so we've grown from, from nothing 15 years ago to, to a big center now. And we've got big visions for the future where we're gonna bring all this together and put it into one place um, on, the, on the med center campus, uh, bring together the basic sciences and the clinical research and expand our mission uh, more broadly than Alzheimer's and focus on other diseases like Parkinson's disease and stroke and bring it all together to go after brain health. And so I wanted to sort of end with this, that we, we've got hope that, you know, we're making progress on the dementia prevention front. We also have hope that we're going to grow uh, even bigger than we are now and really get more uh, and expand our mission to meet the needs of uh, our region even better. So I'll end there. All right. Um, so I am Amanda Zapo Reed. I am a, the scientific uh, director for the physical health interventions team or the FIT team. So I work um, with Dr. Burns to kind of oversee all of those physical health interventions. Um, and I work with a really large team of um, coordinators who help to run those trials. Um, so my primary uh, background is in physical activity and weight management interventions, and I'm really interested in health promotion um, and intervention adherence. So how can we get people to really adhere to the interventions that we know are good for them? Uh, so I'm going to be talking about our COMET study, which is one of the um, health interventions that was most recently funded um, by the National Institute of Health. We actually just received funding in April. So if you want to change this slide, I may. All right, so the COMET study is to study the differential effects of exercise modality on cognition and brain in older adults. Uh, so this is a randomized control trial. It has four arms to evaluate the differential effects of exercise mode on brain and cognition in older adults. And here you can kind of see a little bit about what we're going to be doing with this study. So we plan to roll, um, enroll at least 280 older adults um, into this trial um, for a pretty comprehensive assessment um, battery. We're actually really nearing this study off of Ignite, which is a national, uh, a three-arm or three-site randomized controlled trial with uh, three arms. Um, and we're using a lot of their same measures as well as similar intervention techniques. So our four groups that we're going to be randomizing to following baselines and screening is kind of a control group. So it's core balance training, um, weight training, or endurance training, and then a combined group, which will receive both the endurance and the weight training uh, interventions. And then they will engage in this uh, for 52 weeks with a, a completing that comprehensive battery um, that they did at the beginning, again, at the end of the intervention. And so all of our exercise will be done at the YMCA for 15, 52 weeks under trainer supervision. Um, 
And so if you are more interested in more details about this study, I'm happy to talk with anyone. We really want to engage other investigators in submitting supplemental grants to kind of inform their um, hypotheses, because this is a very large study. Um, and it's not often that we're able to get that many people under one roof to complete um, a group. So we've already received a couple of um, applications for other investigators who are interested in doing uh, supplemental proposals, either through the NIH or through um, other smaller um, institutes. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks everyone. Um, I'm Amber Watts. I am an associate professor in clinical psychology. Um, my interest is in linking the behaviors, the health behaviors with the biological um, mechanisms by which the, the brain is influenced. So a lot of my work is about supporting healthy lifestyles for dementia reduction. I'm gonna talk about the piece today that has to do with how we measure physical activity and sleep. So I do a lot of the actigraphy work um, at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I just wanna talk about um, some ongoing and recently published data projects. So the physical activity and sleep study, which we call PASS, is a study where participants wear wrist-worn activity monitors that measure both activity and sleep. Um, to date, we have about 210 participants, most of whom are cognitively normal, but we do have a fair number of people with Alzheimer's as well. And we asked them to wear it on their wrist for seven days and nights. So you can just see a, a, an example of what some of that data looks like. It gives us a, an idea of how active they are over the course of the day or the week. Um, the, the little diagram on the right with a sun and a moon. Uh, we have some projects going on about um, chronotype, which is basically, are you a morning person or an evening person? And does that um, influence uh, your activity levels and your cognitive performance? We have some interesting stuff um, showing that, that it does, in fact, that people who are evening types have different relationship between physical activity and cognitive performance than people who are morning people. Go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, there's a, a number of other interesting published findings that we've had from actigraphy data. One recent, uh, one that came out recently has to do with gait metrics, and it's uh, less well known um, that there are some motor changes that begin to happen as an early precursor of Alzheimer's disease um, before any of the cognitive symptoms occur. And so we're taking these actigraphy data and looking at things like um, pace, rhythm, and variability of steps and walking to see if we can predict cognitive impairment before it occurs. Um, uh, this central panel is um, from a study that compared men and women in the degree of physical activity variability. So on average in our sample, men and women were equally active, but if you break that down by days of the week or times of the day, women were more um, consistently active, whereas men were more variable, so they were low, high, low, high, whereas women were kind of more even across the time. So it just uh, has sort of interesting implications for how we might go about tailoring interventions for people who have different patterns of activity. And uh, finally, the um, panel on the right shows that diurnal rhythms also dip vary with dementia status. So you can see the solid black line is the pattern of activity for people with mild Alzheimer's disease showing that they are later to get up to their peak activity level, and then they drop off, whereas um, healthy controls have, a, have an activity peak in the morning, um, it lowers down in the afternoon, and then they have a second smaller peak in the evening. So that gives us some hints about the fact that sleep and diurnal rhythms change in people with Alzheimer's disease. And so that is another interesting target that is starting to gain attention is um, interventions to improve sleep in people with dementia and what sleep changes with aging might tell us about risk for Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of cool and interesting stuff coming out of actigraphy work at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. And I'll leave it there, thanks. All right, so I'm Lauren Tomey, I'm an associate professor. Um, my background is actually in medical nutrition science, and I'm a registered dietitian, and I kind of specialize in working with individuals with all intellectual and developmental disabilities, but especially those with Down syndrome. So I'm really interested in how lifestyle factors such as diet and physical activity um, impact cognition and development of Alzheimer's disease and individuals with Down syndrome. Next slide. 
So uh, individuals with Down syndrome have a high risk of um, Alzheimer's disease. Most of them will get it by the time they um, pass away, which average life expectancy is about 65 in this population right now. And um, most of them get it early. So about 90% of them have it by the age of 40. Uh, this is actually some a really interesting graph um, from a recent Lancet article in which they found that changes in the brain start happening in this population about 25, uh, around 25 years of age or about 10 years before um, full like progression of Alzheimer's disease has set in. So there's a lot still to learn in this population, but we really know that we need to have early intervention and in really targeting these people either in uh, adolescence or in young adulthood. Next slide. So we've done some previous work in this population really um, both in terms of diet and physical activity. So we've done um, a couple of randomized controlled trials trying to figure out what best solutions for weight loss in this population are. Um, but more recently, we've been really looking at figuring out how do we get this group active? How do we increase physical activity? And what changes are there in cognition related to physical increases in physical activity? So we've developed a remote um, exercise intervention or remote physical activity intervention where we have everyone do remote physical activity over Zoom just like we're talking right now, because if we would have a health um, educator leading groups of adults with Down syndrome in physical activity lessons that are really tailored um, to their physical abilities and um, their enjoyment. So we'd really try to make it fun. I will say most of the time it ends up in a giant dance party, but you know everyone can use more dance in their lives. So it really works out. Um, what we found, we had a pilot study, it was just 12 weeks long where individuals were asked to either attend one or two of these sessions a week. And we found that those who attended twice a week had a significantly higher change in cognitive function compared to those um, who only attended once a week. And so, uh, I may next slide. We developed and were uh, received funding for a um, R01 that's looking at the promotion of physical activity in this population. So we have 80 adults with Down syndrome who are being randomized to either attending these remote exercise interventions three times a week, once a week, or they get a usual care control, which they don't come to these sessions. And so they just get um, monthly behavior support meetings where we encourage physical activity. And so we're really looking at um, amount of MVPA assessed by accelerometry over 12 months to really see does these, do these remote physical activity, um, do these remote physical activity uh, sessions increase? Um, MVPA. And then we're also looking at cognitive functioning scores using CANTAB. Um, we're looking at MRI. So we're looking at structural resting state and ASL uh, to better understand kind of the influence of physical activity on brain health in this population. We're looking at cardiovascular fitness. So we're doing VO2 max and quality of life. Um, in addition to that, we've started kind of devel developing um, some proposals to start really looking more at nutrition factors and how diet and what we eat might influence aging in this population as well. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stacy Aaron, and I'm currently a postdoc in Dr. Sandra Billinger's REACH lab. Uh, REACH stands for Research and Exercise and Cardiovascular Health. Uh, Dr. Billinger is not only the director of the REACH lab, but is also the director of the Neurovascular Division at the KU ADRC. And our expertise within the lab is assessment of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular function, specifically assessing the effects of exercise on vascular function in older adults as well as individuals with cerebrovascular disease, such as stroke. Uh, next slide, please. So we use transcranial Doppler ultrasound to assess the middle cerebral artery blood flow velocity dynamics during exercise. Uh, Dr. Billinger was the first to develop the method and characterize the MCAV response during exercise. Uh, this protocol includes 90 seconds of rest, followed by six minutes of a moderate intensity. And it's performed on the recumbent stepper. And we do this for multiple reasons, uh, but mainly so that we can test different populations and make comparisons between populations with varying uh, ability levels. And from this modeling technique, we can get not only the resting values, but uh, 
you can hit next slide for me. And yeah, you can keep going. Yeah, so time delay, uh, we're able to get the amplitude, the tau, which is right there, 60% amplitude, and then the, uh, you can keep going, CVR, which is the steady state response um, of the exercise. And as you can see, there's different responses within populations. So active, healthy, young adults, you see a nice increase in velocity. However, with the sedentary older adult, as well as stroke, you see a much less response in velocity and essentially in stroke, you see no response. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is this methodology is new for the lab. Uh, first publication was in 2017. But in a recent publication by our lab, we were able to show that not only resting, but also the MCAV response during exercise was associated with cardiovascular disease risk score. So in cognitively normal older adults, higher cardiovascular disease risk was associated with a blunted resting response, but also a exercise response. And so these results highlight a link between the cardiovascular disease risk and cerebral vascular function. And to help justify our future studies of different exercise modes, such as aerobic and resistance or uh, continuous and interval exercise, we have uh, two R01 level grants planned for submission over the next month to two months. Um, one using these, this assessment along with other supravascular assessments uh, in line with the COMET study. And so we hope to use this modeling technique to assess the training effects of these different modes on cerebrovascular function. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Sandoval. I am a registered dietitian and the LEAP program manager at the um, KUADC. So my job is a little bit different or a lot different from everybody else here. I'm actually not a researcher, um, but my expertise is in nutrition and healthy lifestyle style habits for reducing Alzheimer's risk. And um, my goal and my interest is really to take all of this amazing research that um, our team does as well as you know researchers around the world and turn it into practical fun approachable um, education and outreach programs for reducing alzheimer's risk go ahead jaime thank you um, so this program is um, a combination of various different um, education uh, offerings, and we've reached um, over 3,500 people via 200 plus um, events and classes. We also have a book and we've distributed over 700 of those and we reach um, the KC metro area primarily, but also rural Kansas and uh, Missouri. And now that we're offering online programs, um, you know, we have people from all over the country joining our programs as well. Go ahead. And um, so we've got our, our Brain Power Blueprint book, which is about 160 pages of healthy lifestyle tips and a really valuable tool for the people who participate in our program. Um, we've got the Leap in Action exercise booklet, which is um, exercise tips and pictures to, to help people implement the exercise um, recommendations that we provide in the program. We've got a six to nine week video and class series, which is currently offered online called Brain Health Boot Camp, as well as a four week Mediterranean diet class series also currently offered online. And then we have um, weekly brain health tips that go out via our My Alliance for Brain Health program. And um, so they get weekly emails with all kinds of great brain health tips. We've got weekly group discussion and coaching, which is essentially um, a Q&A session for anybody who's participating in our program to um, come on in and ask any questions they have and get coached on any lifestyle, um, healthy lifestyle habits that they're struggling with. 
We also have a Leap in Action program, which is newer, and that combines um, personal training with our Brain Health Boot Camp education program. So they're getting the education as well as 12 weeks of um, personal training um, to work on their exercise. Uh, we have a clinical trial that is uh, going right now. I think it's almost done. It's got about a year, maybe two left. And um, this is kind of similar to the Leap in Action that I just mentioned, but it's uh, quite a bit longer. It's a full year. They get personal training, they get group exercise, they get the education. Um, and then of course, we're measuring all kinds of things to track um, improvements and how that um, affects brain health. So lots of really exciting uh, applications of this program and every part of the outreach program except for the book is completely free to our community so um, that's a really uh, cool aspect of it as well that's it thank you hello my name is brian hustle i'm a uh, postdoctoral research fellow with um KUMC, and uh, my expertise is really in measurement and promotion of physical activity. Um, I uh, was a director before doing my PhD at a YMCA, and so got a lot of experience with community physical activity promotion um, in a wide variety of populations, uh, including those with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Um, so I work primarily on uh, one of our studies called Moving Together. It's a dyadic approach for remote physical activity intervention in adults with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. So it's kind of unique in that we enroll both the adult with ADRD into the study um, along with their caregiver. And so uh, my interest is really in how can we improve cognition, um, activities of daily living and quality of life, not only in those with AD, but also um, their caregivers who um, are a big part of their life as well. Next slide. So just to give you a little bit of an introduction about the study. So we know that moderate physical activity can improve activities of daily living, quality of life and cognition, um, but MPA or moderate physical activity, moderate intensity physical activity, um, we know that it's lower in community dwelling adults that have AD um, and it's also lower in their caregivers. Um, and so we um, did a pilot study and uh, then applied for um, National Institute of Health funding for a remotely delivered group-based activity um, intervention. Uh, and so with this, we were trying to um, provide social support, but also eliminate some of the barriers uh, like traveling to an exercise facility that could um, hinder participation in exercise programs. And so similar to the Down syndrome study that uh, Dr. Tomi was talking about, um, we remotely deliver our exercise over an iPad um, to participants and their caregivers at their home. Um, and so this dyadic approach, uh, we're, we um, think that it may improve the relationship between adults with AD and their caregivers as well. So in addition to getting some of these benefits like activity, activities of daily living, quality of life, cognition, um, we also think that by participating in the program, um, that'll improve some of the social relationships as well between the um, participant and the caregiver. And so we're measuring this in the study as well. Next slide. Um, so our intervention is a randomized controlled trial and the, um, there's two groups. There's a real-time group video and then an enhanced usual care. Um, the main difference between these two groups is that the real-time group video is the group that participates in the group-based exercise sessions. And so they are attending uh, three times a week for the first six months um, exercise sessions on Zoom with uh, another um, group of uh, participants and their caregivers. And so this is all led by an exercise coach. Um, both groups are getting individual health education lessons. So they meet um, every other week or, or once a month, depending, at the, depending on the stage of intervention um, with a health educator and they cover a wide variety of topics. Um, so our intervention is, is guided by the social cognitive theory, if you're familiar with that. Um, some other key components of our intervention is we use Fitbits to, to monitor activity throughout the study. Um, and then we also do all of our testing at the participants' home. So this makes it 100% uh, remote study. So we do all of the intervention components, but then to um, actually do baseline six month, 12 month um, testing, 
we go out to the participants home with our equipment and do all of the testing there. Um, and then the other unique thing about our program is that um, the dyad or the participant and the caregiver do all of the study activities together. Um, so this includes the testing uh, or any of the intervention components. Um, and our primary aim for this study is just to, to see if um, this remotely delivered exercise session uh, sessions um, can increase moderate physical activity. And then secondary aims, we're looking at uh, those key things like functional fitness, activities of daily living, quality of life, cognition. Um, and so those are our secondary aims. Next slide. And uh, current state of the study. So we have um, three cohorts going on right now um, at different stages. Um, that's 40 dyads that are enrolled in programs. So we're about 40% to our recruitment goal. Uh, and so we're still recruiting and uh, looking at beginning our next cohort in the fall. Thank you. Now we're going to have the presenters <clears throat> presenting mitochondrial contributions to Alzheimer's disease, starting with Dr. Swerlo. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, Jaime. Let me see if it wants to go forward. There you go. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my interests are uh, directed towards how and why mitochondrial energy metabolism dysfunction arises in and contributes to Alzheimer's disease. So from the perspective of a mitochondrial cascade hypothesis, and then how to fix that dysfunction. I'll take the next slide. Our, uh, the research that we perform um, you know, spans the spectrum from um, wet lab fundamental research to translational to, to even clinical. And conceptually, uh, I, I can divide it up into three broad domains, um, the causes and the consequences and the repair of mitochondrial and metabolism dysfunction. Um, in terms of the causes, you know, we're very interested in the possibility that uh, mitochondrial dysfunction uh, may arise uh, intrinsic to mitochondria. For example, from um, mitochondrial DNA, so we're interested uh, in, the, in the impact of mitochondrial DNA variants. We've become very interested in mitochondrial DNA copy number, uh, mitochondrial DNA transcription and, and translation of, of, of those RNAs, and uh, somatic mutation as, as well. We have a study going on looking at um, uh, somatic mutation following a traumatic brain injury in the mitochondrial DNA. But we also recognize that um, Mitochondrial dysfunction may arise extrinsic to mitochondria. We become very interested in how apolipoprotein E uh, impacts mitochondria. We're interested in TOM40 and other uh, gene products that have been implicated in, in Alzheimer's through association studies, GWAS and otherwise. And we also recognize that, that there could be non-gene and environmental uh, effects on mitochondrial function, for example, through uh, drugs or, or lifestyle factors. Regarding consequences, um, we're very interested in tying in mitochondrial biology to the classic Alzheimer's uh, histopathologies, such as APP and A-beta biology and tau and tangle biology, and as well to associated systems that have been implicated in Alzheimer's disease uh, through epidemiology studies or, or through genetic association. So mitochondrial function ties in very nicely to um, to, to a give and take with, with insulin resistance, uh, microvascular changes, lipid biology, inflammation and microglia, endosome and exosome biology, oxidative stress, and oxygen levels and oxygen sensing. And finally, in terms of repair, so uh, identifying the causes and consequences of dysfunction, you know, we wanna fix it. And our research uh, spans from the preclinical to the clinical, so preclinically, we conceptualize interventions, both uh, at, at the drug and lifestyle um, domains and, and um, move on to in vitro testing and animal testing. And because the, the things that we're targeting uh, can often be fairly novel, uh, we recognize that we need biomarkers to um, determine target engagement in the clinical arena. And we've deployed these biomarkers in the clinical uh, arena, along with some of the interventions that we've developed. Um, and so we've done clinical studies uh, with target engagement, evaluating safety, and uh, also moving into studies of efficacy. So uh, thanks very much. That'll do it for me. 
Good afternoon, thank you, Jaime. Um, I'm Heather Wilkins. I'm an assistant professor um, in neurology and I'm also uh, assistant director of the Biomarker Corps. Um, I work with novel biomarker development. And in addition to that, um, my expertise lies in induced polypotent stem cell models of Alzheimer's disease, animal models, and mitochondria and bioenergetics. I have a strong interest in understanding the relationship between Alzheimer's disease genetic risk and energy phenotypes, um, kind of like what Dr. Stradlow spoke about. Um, a lot of my research lies in understanding the relationship between mitochondrial function and amyloid precursor protein and amyloid beta. Um, and so overall, I use a lot of induced platelet stem cell models to kind of recapitulate the bioenergetic and Alzheimer's disease phenotypes that we would see in a human. Next slide, please. So these are some of the models that we have in development. We actually um, get the induced platelet stem cells from fibroblasts, and those fibroblasts are generated from the Alzheimer's disease center clinical cohort. Um, so people can um, opt in um, to um, donate fibroblasts um, at autopsy. And so we have all of the clinical data as well as the autopsy data giving a definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or um, not Alzheimer's disease. And from there, we generate induced pluripotent stem cells from the fibroblasts, which are pluripotent, so they can differentiate um, as we guide them to into either neurons, um, astrocytes, um, or microglia. And we've also begun making cerebral organoids. So on the left of the screen, those are neurons, and in red, you can see mitochondria. So we are able to stain the mitochondria and visualize them. On the um, bottom left, we're actually looking at mitophagy, um, which is shown with a colocalization in green. So we can measure that in real time. In the middle of the screen are cerebral organoids, which we're able to make um, and try to understand um, not only just single cell cultures, but also how do cells interact in, in a particular tissue type. And then on the right are astrocytes um, that we've made recently um, with the mitochondrial stains. So we can visualize the mitochondria within them. So using these new models, our goal is to not only understand Alzheimer's disease, um, but also just understand in general how mitochondria affect um, the different phenotypes that we see. So thank you. And I think Dr. Koppel is next. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wilkins. My name is Scott Koppel. I recently completed my PhD dissertation in the lab with Dr. Russ Swardlow here at the KU ADC. I'm a current MD candidate here at KU Med as well. Uh, and my expertise kind of lies in the molecular effects of the ketogenic diet, its bioenergetics of the brain, as well as neuron glia interactions and applying this through RNA seq technology. Um, my further interests include glial contribution to neurodegenerative disease, as well as the metabolic contributions to AD pathogenesis. And it's my pleasure to tell you just a small amount about a portion of my dissertation I performed looking at the effects of ketone bodies and ketogenic on neuron and astrocyte transcription and what this might mean for Alzheimer's disease. If you aren't familiar, next slide. Uh, the ketogenic diet, this is a low carbohydrate, high fat diet uh, that is capable of producing ketone bodies, the carbohydrate structure that is the diet gets its name from in mammals. Uh, ketone bodies can serve as a reserve or an alternative fuel source for the human brain to supplement glucose metabolism for energy production. Uh, these are used preferentially in the brain as well as in cardiac myocytes as well. Um, and are thought to enhance general brain function. Ketogenic diet's been in use for over 100 years to support patients with epilepsy. And given the known metabolic deficits that we see in Alzheimer's disease, namely carbohydrate metabolism defects and mitochondrial defects, for us, it begs the question that if we can supplement brain metabolism through ketone bodies or the ketogenic diet, can we have some benefit in our AD patient population? Next slide, please. And so one study that I completed uh, involved placing mice on a ketogenic diet over a 90-day period, separating out neurons and astrocytes using magnetic cell separation technology and performing RNA-seq to understand what are the transcriptional consequences of this diet in an intact mouse brain over a chronic period of time. And when we do this and we perform keg pathway analysis, uh, this is an RNA-seq pathway profiling analysis if you're not familiar, we actually were quite gratified that through this unbiased analysis, 
The top three pathologies most associated with changes induced by the ketogenic diet were Alzheimer's disease, as well as Parkinson's and Huntington's disease, so three neurodegenerative diseases. And when we kind of bear down more on what the ketogenic diet influenced to why we got Alzheimer's disease as a significantly implicated model system, uh, were transcriptional changes in known role players such as APP and APOE, as well as the NMDA receptor, but also for our purposes with our interest in mitochondrial uh, contributions to AD is transcriptional changes in all five of the mitochondrial electron transport chain subunits. When we study this further in vitro, this looks to really be a neuron specific phenomenon as ketone bodies are known to support respiration in neurons, but in data not shown here, we did not see that supported in astrocyte models as well. And so this is just a small portion, a small introduction, but I also wanna let you know that we're interested in pursuing this further as generally the ketogenic diet increased transcription of pathways such as oxidative phosphorylation, but as well as other possibly related pathways such as an ER protein processing transcriptional pathways in insulin signaling as well in neurons. Whereas in astrocytes, as I've alluded to, had a completely different effect where we actually saw suppressed transcription in things such as the glutamatergic synapse, the ER protein process, processing pathway and insulin signaling. And we're just interested in kind of following this up more to see if we can get at a mechanism of benefit that we can develop into a dietary mimetic for our AD patient population with the goal of improving brain health and reducing neurologic disease risk or severity. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our colleague, Dr. Robin Honey. Hi, thanks, Dr. Koppel. Um, I am a research associate professor in neurology, and my primary primary duties at the KU ADC are um, neuroimaging related. I'm associate director of the neuroimaging core, and my primary expertise is in using various neuroimaging modalities to look for genetic and familial risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm really interested in understanding the relationship between Alzheimer's risk and then some of our other ATN related neuroimaging phenotypes that we're developing. Um, and we're also working on machine learning and other biomarker development to be used in all the studies that you saw from some of the other researchers. Um, so one of the main projects that I'm working on is neuroimaging PWAS. You can keep it, you can keep it. Um, we just started a new deep phenotyping core. You can <laughs> go forward, sorry, Javi. Um, a deep phenotyping core really to kind of merge a lot of our data. We have a lot of um, clinical data, metabolic data, genetic data in our um, sample that we've collected for years that we also are merging with our neuroimaging data to, to develop new hypotheses um, and engage the multimodality database. That's one application we're doing is developing machine learning to combine um, and maximize our genetics and our imaging data and some of our other omics data to be able to ask questions about AD. And um, some of the markers we're looking at are um, genetics, amyloid, tau, brain structure and function, metabolic and vascular markers, and um, many others that are being developed in the various labs. Next slide. And this is just one quick slide to show you um, just a recent result that we're um, applying some of our data to. It's a neuroimaging PWAS of TOM40, which is a nuclear gene encoding for um, mitochondrial function, and APOE, um, another risk, key risk gene in Alzheimer's that are right next to each other. Um, they have a, a very um, interesting, possibly overlapping role, but one thing we wanted to do was tease out using some um, high quality sensitive um, structural phenotypes that are characterizing brain architecture, especially that change in Alzheimer's and, and AD. And in this particular case, we found that the TOM40 poly T allele um, had impact on sulcal depth, and it's a, it's a measure of gy gyrus and sulcus relationship in the brain that changes with aging, whereas APOE did not. Um, and some of these phenotypic markers that are a little bit more um, computationally intensive or also maybe more sensitive to looking at the different changes that are um, associated with risk for AD. And then I'm also gonna talk for Jill Morris. She's in the middle of another talk. So next slide. Um, Jill is our um, assistant director of the biomarker core here. She's an assistant professor in neurology and she directs the ADC developmental project program. 
She has a lot of expertise in energy metabolism and Alzheimer's disease. She's truly a translational scientist. Um, she does um, clamp studies, meal testing, biopsies. She runs our Samoa HDX, which runs all of our fluid biomarkers for our studies and many others across the campus and, um, and does a lot of translational research linking these cellular and systemic markers with brain outcomes with neuroimaging as well. Um, and then she also looks for mechanisms for individual differences in response to treatment and a role for different energy substrates. Um, one example of her work is looking at glucose metabolism and brain aging and Alzheimer's. Next slide. This is something Jill and I did together where we combined imaging data and um, data on clinical data on fasting glucose over one year. We found that individuals that had fasting glucose that worsened over a year, um, and again, this is just a one-time measure at each time point, but if it worsened, they had increased amyloid in their precuneus despite having no cognitive changes or other markers for Alzheimer's disease. So Jill's work is showing that there's some metabolic changes that may happen early on um, that can be captured looking at glucose and insulin. That's all. Thank you. And I'm aware that we've gone over the hour, um, but we have some job opportunities that we wanted to share very quickly. And then some Q&A if, if there's, I don't know if there's time, Dr. Kuros, but no, 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 yeah, we definitely want to hear about the job opportunities. <laughs> so, go ahead. Uh, so, so Dana Richards, please. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, by the way. Hello, so I'm Dana Richards. I am the administrative officer at the Alzheimer's Disease Center. And after hearing all that, I'm sure you know that we have a lot currently going on and we are continuing to grow. So that gives us a great opportunity to add to our employees, add to our staff. And currently we have open positions for administrative assistants, clinical research coordinators, clinical research assistants, research associates, including a neuroimaging research associate and a few others will find recruitment assistants. And then we do have some fixed term student positions available. So you can find those by going to kumc.edu and clicking on jobs in the right hand corner. From there, you can search for Alzheimer's Disease Center and all of those open positions will show up. Or you can email kuadc at kumc.edu and I would be happy to send you additional information or the application links for those positions. Thank you, and thank you everybody for an excellent presentations. And one question um, that I have in high mail, most of the, the, the attendees are actually a junior a investigators. And um, so if anybody wants to learn more about like postdoctoral a opportunities, you know, like what would be the best way to actually learn about those opportunities? or like, you know, opportunities for research collaborations. What about if they're interested in learning more about a, how to collaborate with the, the team or investigators? What would be the best way to, to get in touch or, yeah. Who wants to respond <laughs> to this one? I, um, usually with postdocs, what happens is they, they go straight to our website and looks at what each of us does and, and contacts the person directly. But they can also, uh, you know, email Dana Richards if, if, if they want, like at the email that she mentioned. And I think that, that could be helpful as well, mentioning what their line of research, research interest is, for example. I don't know if anyone else has any other answer, but I thought that, that would be a good one. Yeah, and to add on to that, again, if you're not sure exactly a specific person you want to collaborate with, that KUADC at KUMC.edu email, I will always respond to those and make sure that we can find the best opportunities for whatever you're looking for. Thank you. And are there any, uh, I don't know, T32 opportunities or any like grand level opportunities like that, like for trainees that may be interesting? 
we're I, I I am aware that we're working on we've applied for some, but we, I don't know that we have any yet. Right. Uh, so Jaime, this is Amanda. Um, we are currently looking for a postdoctoral fellow to work on Comet as well as other um, projects within the ADC. So that would be something for trainees. And then we always have the option of uh, NIH diversity, diversity supplements. So supplements to the different uh, NIH funded grants that we have uh, to increase diversity in the workforce that uh, encompasses from all the, from uh, high school all the way to faculty. So that's another thing that we're very interested in. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions from the attendees. So it's not like I feel free to send the questions later or I'll make sure to pass it to the team. Thank you again, everybody, for the excellent presentations and congratulations on their work. Very exciting and very interesting, too. Like I learned a lot. So I really appreciate you taking the time to present and share your work with us. So thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Kyle. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thanks, team.